So for question one, um, if we were given these points, but write the order pair that the inverse uh, would have. So since the inverse is just switching the input and output or switching the X and the Y, you can just switch the X and the Y of each of these points. Etc. And so if these were points on a function, these could be points on its inverse or vice versa because that's all inverse means. You're switching input with output. Okay, algebraically, the only way to prove that functions are inverses of each other is with composition of functions, and that's where you plug a function into another function. So if I was to plug g into f, it would look like that. And if I was to plug f into g, it would, oops, um, Here's what f looks like, or g looks like, and plug f in. Okay, and then both of these need to simplify. So if you distributed the 4, add 12 minus 12, distribute the 1 fourth, minus 3 plus 3. If they're really inverse functions, <clears throat> when you plug them into each other like this, uh, they're sub both supposed to simplify to x. So just make sure that you do both ways. Just plug in one into the other and showing that it comes out to x is not enough. You have to show both directions. Okay, one to one means that it passes the one to one, the vertical line test and the horizontal line test. The vertical line test is a quick way to test to see if it is a function and the horizontal line test is a quick way to see if the inverse is a function. Okay, so a function that is one-to-one, -one, anything that passes the vertical and horizontal line test will work. There's just one example. <clears throat> Part A is a little tricky in that it has to be a function, so it has to pass as a vertical line test, but then not be one-to-one. -one. So something like y equals x squared that's certainly a function, but since it doesn't also pass the horizontal line test, then it is not one-to-one. -one. You don't have to have these exact answers. These are just examples. Okay, given a function, you should be able to find its inverse, and this question even gives you some hints on how to do that. So you might say f of x is the same thing as y, and inverse is just where you switch the input with the output, <clears throat> and then we like our functions to be solved for y. And then to distinguish, um, reduce confusion here, saying that this is y and saying that this is y, and those are not really the same thing. That's not really good practice here. So this guy was the function. This guy was the inverse. Make sure you get used to writing that uh, notation, please. Okay, so <clears throat> write a t-chart for f. So if I plugged in 0, if I plugged in 1, and if I plugged in 2, and then state the domain of the function. Okay, well, if you've got the function here, and you can think about what it looks like, square root of x looks like this. The plus 1 would shift it left 1. You might be able to look at the graph and say that it's negative 1 to infinity. Those are the x values that it hits. But sometimes you may not know what the function looks like over here. Um, or you may think it's too cumbersome to think about what the graph looks like. So another important thing for you to do with inverse functions is <coughs> to realize how domain and range are connected. Here's the function, here's the inverse. Okay, so domain just means the possible x values it can have, and range is the possible y values it can have. Well, if in inverse functions you're switching x and y, 
then possible x's become possible y's, and possible y's become possible x's, and vice versa. So up here, um, this was his domain, which means the range, if it had been asked, of the inverse would be the same thing, 0 to infinity. And then the range of this one, this is just x squared shifted down 1, so that would be negative 1 to infinity. So its range of the function becomes the domain of the inverse. So you've got multiple paths to get that answer, but it's kind of good to know all of them so that um, you have some choices there. Okay, question five is similar to question one, just kind of written kind of differently. These are uh, points of a function, switch x and y to get a point on the inverse. Switch x and y, switch x and y. That's it. Number six is probably the trickiest question, <clears throat> or the hardest to do, because you have to be a little bit creative here. Um, but odd functions, you have to remember what an odd function looks like. It is symmetry with respect to the origin. So something like x cubed is uh, symmetric with respect to the origin, because I could rotate it 180 degrees or turn my paper upside down, and it would still look the same. So that's a characteristic of an odd function. It does have to be a function, so that means it has to pass the vertical line test, but the task here is to find one that does not have an inverse function. So that means it fails the horizontal line test. So you have to be a little creative here. Um, this one passes the horizontal line test, so x cubed is not good enough. And um, one possibility is you could do something like this. This is still a function. It passes the vertical line test. It's odd because it's symmetric to the origin. Roughly, my sketch isn't the best. But it no longer passes the horizontal line test. So this is one possible answer. Meets the requirements uh, and still makes it fail the horizontal line test like they asked. So. That one you have to be a little creative on, just don't give up too quick. All right, the graph of a function must pass the, if it's a function vertical line test, that ensures that each input is mapped to exactly one output. If the graph passes the horizontal line test, that tells us that its inverse is a function. And if it passes both, then it's referred to as a one-to-one -one function.